Welcome to Dumb Fight Fans. To the Fighters Boys Kick Ass Podcast. Your Fight Talk Authority. Not to mention the most entertaining and talked about podcast with your kick ass host, Richard Ortiz. You mad? Come at me, bro. And his loyal kick ass co host, Senor Cole Escovito. Streaming live and worldwide. Coming to you all the way live from a little place somewhere in Cali. The Fighters Boys Kick Ass Podcast. Fresno, California. We're live here in Mad Production Studios in Fresno, California. The big Fresno, the big 559. Too bad we didn't have the fair this year. But we did have a, a lineup of food, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's crazy because the whole uh, coronavirus, we couldn't have people there, but yet we showed up in cars and lines to get that big Fresno fair food. And uh, nothing like a corn dog, I guess, and some, uh, what's that called with that strawberry, that, that float cake or something, man. I must be hungry because I'm thinking about food right off the bat. Ladies and gentlemen, we got a great show for you this, to this, this evening. I'm without my co-host, Cole Escovito. He's on assignment, actually, and he's taking care of some business with some big news coming. And all I can say is he, he is in the San Jose area. So if you know MMA in San Jose, I'll let you put the two and two together. Nevertheless, ladies and gentlemen, we have with us one of the big pieces to the puzzle and we all know about combate americas when they come to fresno save mart center they always put on a great show man i mean the the matchmakers the the ring announcers uh the card girls you name it the staff all together mike and from and, and campbell and they just put on a great show man and tonight's guest we have with us is we got the vice president of fight operations and fight director the one and only ladies and gentlemen mr tony padilla welcome to the show tony how we doing rich how you doing my man i'm doing i'm doing good man how are you i'm good bro i'm good i mean uh looking forward to talking to you i mean fresno is uh is pretty much home base for us with combate americas here in socal well in california i should say yeah uh, so it's a pleasure to be talking to you Hey, man, the, the pleasure's all mine. I heard good things about uh, Inframowitz. You know, he threw some names at me, and he said, first of all, you got to have Tony on. I mean, this guy is an OG when it comes to MMA. And, you know, I posted some pictures that I had to put together because, you know, it's hard to find a picture of you, man. You're like, you're like uh, uh, you know, have you found Waldo yet? No, I haven't. You know, like the, the guy behind the curtain. <laughs> so, so we put something together. Hey, and, no, be, be, be honest with you, Rich. I'm a ninja, brother. That, I, uh... I stay low profile, I'm old school, OG, you know, it's not about me, it's not about, you know, my, my face, my persona, it's about the fighters and the fights. So I like to stay low key, and be honest with you, I don't do many interviews, uh, so when my guy told me for this one, I'm like, hey, you know what, I might as well get used to this, uh, let me give it a shot and see how I do, so here I am right now. Hey, here you are, man. It, it, it's all good, man. As I was saying, I, when I posted your picture, the, I got the same response. Hey, that's an OG in the MMA game right there. Oh, hey, yeah, yeah. that's uh, a compliment, brother. I mean, like I said, I stay low profile. Been in the game since uh, 2006. Uh, my, first, uh, my first introduction to like a live MMA was uh, actually 2006. So I've been around a while, but like I said, I stay low profile, very humble. Um, but but I've been in the game for a while, so I know a little bit. I should say, still learning every day. Uh, as we all are. So in 2006, one of your first uh, big events was uh, BJ Penn, Matt Hughes, right? I mean, what a matchup! I mean, you're going way back to the old school guys. Well, I mean, I mean, look at it this way. So I grew up uh, born in the '70s, grew up in the '80s. Finally, had the means to start going to. I grew up a boxing fan, so I started going to events when I had a little money in my pocket in the late 80s, early 90s. So I started going to boxing. <clears throat> so, you know, I, I love boxing. I was in the mix, you know. Back in the 80s, I grew up with Hagler, Duran, Hearns, uh, Arguello. You know, just the, the old school boxing is what I grew up with. So when I went to my first event, MMA event, I'm like, oh, damn, this is another thing that I love. So how am I going to be able to afford going to boxing events and going to MMA events? So that's where it all started right there, just a brainstorm in 2006. So you actually had that conversation with yourself. You said, okay, well, what am I going to check out, boxing or MMA? And, and you got hooked on MMA, as we, as we know, because you're, you're now working in the MMA world. Yeah, definitely. No, so I, when I went to my first MMA event, I was like, this is so much faster. 
you know, it, it, it's just the adrenaline rush is a little bit more than boxing. I mean, no, no disrespect towards boxing. I, I, sure. like, I said I, I grew up with it, but the adrenaline rush was just so much different. So I'm like, wow, this is this is something that I think I'm gonna get into and I'm gonna dive into. So I'm like, how can I make money? How can I afford to go to both of these events now? So as things went on, uh, boxing, I'm not gonna say died out, but the big fights weren't there yeah. like they were in the 80s, and the big fights were coming up in, in, in MMA. So it kind of just steered me that way to where I, I, I geared myself more towards MMA <clears throat> at that point. So then you, you started your own promotions, right? You wanted more than just ringside seats. You, you wanted actually put, putting on the event. Correct, correct. Yeah, no, in, uh, in 2006, I, my daughter, my last uh, kid was born. My mm -hmm. daughter was born in July. September, I went to the, uh, the BJ Penn uh, Hughes fight, and that's when I'm like, man, I got to do something with this. And that's when I started the totally line. That's when... Tap Out was probably at its peak, you know, uh, they're making a killing doing their clothing line. So I go, let me, let me try this out. Let me start a clothing line, sponsor fighters, go to fights. And in doing that, fighters would always come back to me and say how bad promoters were. I mean, they would just talk so bad about promoters. And I'm like, you know, little by little, I'm like, maybe I could be that different type of guy, yeah. that different promoter where I could not be such a you-know-what and, and treat the fighters fairly. So little by little, I started gearing myself to, and, okay, let, let me try and do a show. So in 2007, I found a local boxing promoter here uh, named Ed Holmes. He's a boxing promoter. Yeah, I've heard of Ed Holmes. And, yeah, and I, so I, I, I literally had a meeting with them and asked if I could shadow him for a few months and, and, and see if I could... Uh, you know, if I could, uh, if this is something I want to do. Yeah. So I, I literally sat around for about six months. He let me use his promoter's license to do my first event. And, I mean, it was, it was just a journey. I mean, those six months was just eye-opening. I would follow him to meetings, meeting with fighters. And, and mind you, this is all boxing. So it's yeah. different. It's a different school of thought. But anyway, I took what I could from him, did my first event in 2008 in July, sold the place out. First nice. event, and everybody was like, "Wow, you sold out your first event. This is great for you." So at that point, I'm like, I was hooked. As nervous as I was, I mean, as much money was on the line, yeah, it, it was just, it was one of those things where why did I get myself into this? But on Monday morning, I'm like, I'm ready to do it again. And I mean, hey, just it was just like a fighter entering the ring, man. That that nervousness, you, you didn't know the outcome. Uh, you, you know, you did everything, you prepared yourself for this event, and, and you sold out. So you got hooked with your first event with boxing. When did you get hooked on on MMA and put on your first MMA event? And 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 let us know what was the difference between between promoting boxing and promoting MMA. Well, my first event was MMA. Oh, okay, I, I see. Oh, okay, you used a boxing license. You shadowed the boxer correct. at homes. Well, okay, well, correct. Well, uh, California State Athletic License is good whether you're doing boxing okay. or you're doing MMA. So I did, uh, and believe me, uh, Ed Holmes is an old school boxer guy. He was literally sending me away from MMA as much as he could. <laughs> uh, but I had, I had my mindset. I want yeah. MMA. This is what I want to do. And boom, that, that's what exactly what I did. And uh, as much as he was sending me away from doing MMA, I think a few months later he did his own MMA, even though he was so much against MMA. So it can open his eyes as well yeah you know a, a promoter is a promoter um at, at all costs I and mean, any any combat sport in in whatever's the new today you know whatever's happening today and whatever's working and i remember that time that transition when boxing kind of died down and and MMA was just taken off completely from, from the apparel line to, to everybody wanted to train to to looking for an MMA gym i remember that time in that transition so when did you transition yourself from, from promotions to just hopping aboard? I remember you, you first, uh, as I recall, wanted to get started with uh, Bellator, correct? Correct. Yeah, no. Well, I, so back in 2008, I had my first event. Um, you know, I sold the place out. I broke even, so I didn't lose money. Uh, I was good to go. I had a couple more events after that. It didn't fare so well. You know, I lost money here and there, but it was still, I was, it was too late. I was already hooked. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then, then uh, as, as far as things go, I mean, 
Okay, you were getting ready to, to apply, or, or you were, you were um, seeking um, uh, Bellator. And, and during that time, was Bellator. Christian was Christian Printup involved during that time? Yes, he was. So, so I had a friend of mine, uh, Zach Light. He was a okay. matchmaker for, for Bellator. This was going back to like 2012. So I heard through the grapevine that there was an opening for a matchmaker. And I'm not saying that I was a matchmaker at the point, but I have done everything to that point from putting up the cage. Uh, I mean, literally A to Z since I had my own promotion. Sure. I've done it. And I've matchmade my own shows. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to put a resume together, send it to Bellator and see where it goes. So next thing you know, I had Tim Danaher from Chicago where he was with Bellator. I think he was a VP at that point. He called me. We set up an uh, interview in Costa Mesa. Bjorn and Tim flew in. I had an interview with them in 2012. Um, I didn't get the job, but at that point, they started utilizing me as a local promoter. Sure, like when they would have events around your area. Yeah, every time they come to Southern California, they would put me and uh, put me on board to do the matchmaking here in uh, Southern California. So my first event was at the Brent Center in Irvine. Uh, 2012. So ever ever since then, from 2012 to 2017, before I got with Kumbate, I was a local promoter for Bellator. And obviously there was a transition from uh, Bjorn Redney to, to Scott Coker. And, yes. But I was still able to keep that job after I met with Scott Coker and Rich Chow with the trans during the transition. Well, you were just trying to get your feet wet and, and but but continue to knock down those doors and in those in those barriers. When did you meet with, with Combate, and when did you get your first taste of, of one of their shows? Uh, 2017, they were actually having a show in Burbank, California. And uh, they had just purchased their, their first cage. They, they purchased their cage in Kentucky, and it was en route to Burbank where they were having an event. So apparently there was a mix-up when, when the cage was going to get there, was it going to get there on time? Right. And uh, they were a little bit nervous on it's a case to be here for the show. Wow. So at that time, they were working with uh, Steve Bash, another local uh, boxing promoter. He called me and said, hey, Tony, we might need your cage. You know what? Have it on standby. So at that point, I showed up to the event with my cage. Their cage actually got there. I helped them set them up. And, uh, you know, at that point, it was uh, Mike Afron and Larry, Larry Kahn, they said, hey, you know what, you did a good job. We're having a show in Miami. Do you mind helping us get this case from point A to point B? It was from LA to Miami. <clears throat> so I said, yeah, sure, no problem. So I helped them get the case from LA to Miami, went to Miami, helped them put up the case. And that little by little, they started realizing that I could do a little bit more for them than just put up a case. Uh, they utilized you, man. Yeah. They utilize your skills. They they, they, they they realize that you play more than just shortstop and second base. Yeah. You know what? I, I'm old school. I'll do whatever it takes to make shit happen. I That's mean, right. Things happen. Excuse my friend. Hey, it, it's all good. Because today we're on the kick-ass podcast, so you can let them fly out as much as you want, man. You're good. Yeah, yeah. Well, don't tell me that, bro. <laughs> okay. Uh, so anyway, uh, after that, it was uh, it was literally a trip to Cancun. They were having the Copa Combate, which is the yearly tournament that that. Combate has. Yes. And they flew me out because they were using the cage that they weren't very really comfortable with. Yeah. And they wanted me to check out. So they flew me to Cancun for a week. I was really there seven days, all inclusive. Uh, nice. To check out the cage. It, it, was, it was a wonderful experience. I'm like, man, this is beautiful. I'm in Cancun, doing what I love, uh, inspecting the cage. You know, I did a report on the cage, let them know what I thought about it, but it was like, this is beautiful. I mean, right. next thing you know, I helped put up the cage, did my report on it, and next thing you know, I'm helping work the tournament. I'm, I'm running fighters from from the locker room to the I was like, hey, this is great, I love this. So like I said, little by little, I just worked my way in, whether it was me working my way in or, or I was able to, they were able to utilize me, you know, however you want to look at it. Yeah. No, I'm listening to this story, man, and it's just awesome. We're talking about starting from the ground up, and we had several guests that, I mean, that it started from the ground up. One that comes to mind is, um, he started off as the matchmaker uh, uh, for uh, Golden Boy, and, and that's uh, R Roberto Diaz. 
and you know, not to get into a story too long, but he started just just by meeting one of his uh, favorite fighters at the time, Marco Antonio Barrera. Nevertheless, I mean, today he is now the vice president of Golden Boy Promotions. So when I'm listening to your story, er every time that I that you speak, there, there's another chapter, and there, there's another. Uh, I don't want to say, well, yeah, let's 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 use the word promotion because you continue to grow. So continue your story, man, and then, then we're going to start with all these questions coming in. But I want to hear the story only because you started from the ground up. Yeah, I mean, sticking to what you were just saying, I mean, I'm, I'm a, I grew up very humble, very modest me. So there's no, no job that I won't do to help benefit myself and Correct. benefit whoever I'm working for. So if I need to, uh, I'm going to tell you the truth. Well, I started, I started off at a show in San Diego, I was wiping blood off a canvas for a promoter uh, that needed help and I wanted to learn the ropes. So I went from literally the bottom up, like you said. Yeah. And, you know, I'm a very humble person. If I had to go back to do that right now, I would still do it. But it, it is one of those things where you just, you know, you, you thrive and thrive and thrive and, and if you work hard enough, you get to get to where you want to be. And am I where I want to be? I'm very comfortable where I want to be. I mean, Combat the Medicus has been very, very, very nice to me. I mean, they, they've exposed me to things that I've never thought I've seen before. I mean, before I was a local promoter doing shows here, doing very well. But now I'm traveling the world, putting fights together for a worldwide audience. Yes. And, you know, it, it's just an, it's a humbling experience. And, and I'm going to continue to do it. Um, just because it's 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 a, literally a dream, you know. And sometimes I wake up, I'm like, "This is really what I do." I mean, I work from home. That's awesome. You know, I, I get to travel. I get to travel. Unfortunately, you know, the coronavirus has put a a kink in, in every Olympics game, but yeah, it's not going to last forever. And, and you know, the times to come back are, are very strong. Well, hey, you do what you love, you never work a day in your life, and you know, I, I've been saying that lately, and and that's exactly you're living proof of that, my man. No, definitely, definitely. Uh, I'm very blessed, and, and believe me, I look in the mirror every day, and I'm a happy camper. I, I bet you are, man. And, and uh, you know, working side by side with, with Mike and Framowitz, man, I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. Every time I have a conversation with that man, I'm learning something, literally. And he let me, he'll, he'll let me ask away. And uh, he'll, he'll let me know what I need to do and, and what I can do to, to improve and to take that forward step. Yeah, no, my guy has been around for a while. I mean, uh, I know he comes back from the, uh, the strike force, and I think before that, uh, you know, he, he's, he's been around the game for a while. Yeah, so, he's, you he's, know, he, he, he juggles a lot of balls. <laughs> I'm sure he does. That probably didn't come out right, man, but I know exactly what you're talking about. He's probably getting a chuckle right now, man. Tell us about what's your position today, today, right now with Combate Americas. And, and where did you, when you first started with them, okay, you started with them with, with the cage. They utilized you. What title did they give you, and where are you today? Literally, when I started, I had no title. I was just like, hey, come check out this cage. I'll just put us off. Uh, inspect the cage. I literally had no title. So then, uh, after they, they realized maybe I could do a little bit more for them, I, I was the fight director. That's when I got hired on in 2017. 2018. 2018 as fight director, which is, it was match making. And then, uh, from there, I was, you know, match making the show, helping match make the shows. I was pretty much in charge of, uh, the U.S. talent. And then in 2000, early 2020, this year, the, the gentleman that was matchmaking the Latin town, uh, he, he left the company. So it was wide open for me to jump right in and handle both the U.S. and Latin American town and matchmake uh, both. And on top of that, uh, obviously with the operational side, you know, I make sure the cutmen are there, supplies are there, cake is there, uh, ambulance is there. This A to the operational wise yeah. is I make sure everything is on point ready to go for showtime there there you go man i mean you handle it from uh start to finish and that that's a great title to have too man and, and it's, like you said even without the title that's something that you enjoy doing and you're passionate about it yeah no and thank god that i have a, a little experience in it you know obviously absolutely i come from a, a local promotion my own promotion uh the nuts and bolts are the same as far as getting the case said we can certainly the sponsors are on the bumpers, the sponsors are on the canvas, 
uh, make sure the ambulance is there, make sure the doctors are there. All those are, are operational things that are, are are the same for every show, regardless yeah. of whether you're a, you're on HBO, you're on Univision, you're wherever you're at. It doesn't matter. Those things are the same. So yeah. those are things I'm used to. So those are the things that I'm good with, and I'm very organized. I mean, my memory is terrible, but <laughs> I'm I'm one of those gentlemen that take copious amount of, of notes. I've done it long enough to where it's kind of repetitious now. So I'm very comfortable in in that doing my job. Well, hey, you're a perfectionist, man. You want to make sure everything gets done right, properly. It doesn't matter how long you've been doing it. You, you double-check everything and, and make sure everything's organized. That's the main thing. Yeah, no, I mean, with us, obviously, with the, with the bigger event, you have, it, it's televised, obviously, televised. So if, if you think about the big picture, you start worrying about how many people are watching the show. Yeah. And, and one, one little thing to put a hiccup in the whole show, you don't have the ambulance there, the doctor's not there, you could, you could literally put a wrench and everything so you really have to uh bow your eyes and cross your t's exactly man you gotta you gotta make sure the lights stay on too because <laughs> i bet some events and, and things can happen yeah no definitely i mean we i've been at events where a fighter's ready to walk out and he doesn't make the walk out oh wow it, it wow yeah so, so okay, hey, you just saved one of the questions. Now, now, why was that? Was that because something going on? I mean, he's getting cold feet, or or just the event is just too much for him? Yeah, I think uh, when it comes down to it, it's literally the nerves get to you, and it's just cold feet. I mean, you can make every excuse in the book, and believe me, I give I give credit to any fighter that steps into the cage. I don't care if you last seconds or you go the full three rounds. You have my you know respect. But, you know, it's, you know, when you, when you come in to check-ins, then you have to go get pictures and you have to talk to the, the commentators. It, it's a little bit different than, than a local promotion. So it, the nurse might get to you. And, I mean, I'm not going to call out any names, but, I mean, literally, I'm thinking one time we were in Fresno, a gentleman just did not want to make the walk. And there were literally minutes before showtime. Wow. Yeah, and you gotta understand. I mean, we have TV production. Wow. Uh, there's a lot. There's a lot of. Uh, uh, it, it, it's fluid. There's a lot of things in motion. So uh, you know, we have to assess an R and be professional, and still make the show happen. Now, did did he eventually uh, end up making the walk? No, he did not. Oh wow! He did not. The, the doctor got involved, and once the doctor says. You know, if you tell a doctor you're yeah. not feeling well, yeah. you know, the doctor, you know, he's not going to make you walk. No. It is what it is. I, it, it's almost like you, you need to have like a, a I don't want to say a psych, but someone there to talk to you and say, okay, look, it's all mental. Um, you know, let, let, let's make that walk. But then, again, you're talking him into it. You you know, if a fighter don't want to fight, I guess he just don't want to fight. Exactly. If I have to talk to you into making my walk, then you shouldn't be there in the first place. Yeah, no, 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 I hear you, man. So let, let's talk about Fresno, man, and let, let's talk about your plans and some fight dates. I know it's hard to really um, ink those dates in, so do we have anything in pencil? When, when's the next time uh, Combate Americas is going to be live in action, and, and where are we looking to uh, drop that cage door at? Well, as mentioned in the beginning, I was like, Fresno is our, our, our first home here in Cali. You know, there's a ton of talent, hungry fighters, they all got heart. They all got Cora. If, if you know yeah. the Latin community, that's heart. Yeah. So we love Fresno. We love the Central Valley. They, they come out. There's a lot of talent there. And when we're in California, most of the time we do shows there in Fresno. So obviously with the pandemic, there's no uh, audience allowed. So right now we're looking at doing studio shows. So as far as doing the show in Fresno, we won't know anything until this coronavirus uh, you know, it, there's just a different story with the current fire. Yeah. There's peaks and valleys. One one month we're we're golden, we're we're below. Next thing you know, things are popping up, and and, and it looks scary on our end. No, I, I, let, let me tell you, man, when you come to Fresno, we're, we're excited to see our, our own uh, compete. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking of, of, you know, the Avalos brothers, Jose Avalos. I mean, he always puts a, a good uh, crowd in the seats. Uh, Adrian Guzman, I mean, he, he's, he's another one, man. I mean, that kid has heart. And uh, before... Uh, I'm telling you, were, were you there? I'm sorry to cut you off. No, no, go for it, brother. When, when, when Guzman fought Ramirez? Absolutely, I was there. 
Absolutely, I was there. That, that was probably fight, fight of the year. I mean, they, these guys, they were actually knocking each other out and knocking each other back in. That fight was bananas. Bananas. And that's exactly what Bombas is looking for. I don't give a, you know what, yeah. about your skill set. Not that I don't, but it plays a factor. Your skill yeah, absolutely. Set, you know how long you've been training. But if you come in there, win or lose, and you show art like that, you're coming back. I'm going to put you on TV again. That's exactly what we're looking at. I mean, look at, look at Clay Weida. Oh, yeah. How many times has he won? How many times has he lost? But you know, how many times has he put on a freaking show? Exactly. You know what? No, nobody he's even keeps track. Nobody even keeps. That's actually one of Cole's favorite uh, fighters he likes to bring up. Nobody keeps track of his winners and losses. It's showtime with him. Win, lose, or draw, exactly. he puts on a show. Standing ovation. No, and that's exactly what I look for. Like I said, skill set is one thing. Yeah. But if you come in and you have that heart. Yeah. I mean, if you have heart and skill set, that's one thing. I mean, you're, you're, you're ridiculous. But if you come in. And you have heart, man. It's just bananas. You know, I'm going to put you on again. Let's put you on again. Win or lose, I don't give a shoot. <laughs> put on the show. Put on the show. That's what I want. That's what we want. And, and obviously, you know, our, our base is, you know, the Latin base. Yeah. We come from Mexican fighters or, you know, South of the border fighters. You know, people that, that are known to have heart. Yeah. So you put on the show, people are going to love that. You're going to make fans. That's what we want. A absolutely. I, I know for a fact because I, I gave a pair away through some promotion through uh, uh, Combate Americas. And, and one of uh, the, the tickets that I gave away to, uh, he was a principal. And, I, and, you know, I'll give him a little shout out. His name was uh, 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 Prince Marshall, right? And uh, uh, that was his first live event. And he happened to see uh, Adrian Guzman in, in the cage. He is now a big fan. Um, before the uh, pandemic hit, they were actually going to make contact. And he was going to have Adrian go to the, the, uh, the eighth grade and talk to the students there. All, beca all because of the desire and all because that was his first event and since then he's been following him as a fan and now he's hooked he's always texting me yeah. and, and letting me know hey man let me know when they're coming back no Adrian is actually a fighter that I saw I saw him fight for the first time uh, in Fresno I booked him for a fight and, and literally right after his fight I booked him after that fight I, I, I actually signed him to a contract I mean but like I said uh, Fresno has so much talent uh, I mean uh, the Avalos brothers yeah, uh, Paul Elizondo. There you uh, go, Paul. Serena Herrera, uh, and then I, I know they're not from Fresno, but the the process is just Oh yeah, yeah, St yeah, Stephanie yeah. Zoila, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, there's just tons of talent in Fresno. So believe me, when I go there, it's like a club, and I'm like, hey, I'm not gonna have any problem putting fight together there. Hey, if you if you ever do like a um, a senior event, man, I mean, bring back a uh, big Levar Johnson or or Joe Soto, and uh, hell, get Co Escovito back in there. I mean, we'll make it happen, man. I mean, Fresno is a uh, is always open for uh, these big names to return in some uh, shape or form. No, no. To be honest with you, I was looking forward. I thought I was going to talk to Cole today. I know, I know, he's old school. He's been at it since uh, the early 2000s. Oh yeah. Uh, that's a, that's a name that goes way back. So I was looking forward to talking to him, but. Hey, you know what? Everything's a phone call away. Once we Absolutely. get going, uh, hopefully the, the COVID situation goes uh, away sooner rather than later. Uh, believe me, that, that that's a name that can be thrown out there. No, yeah, and, and you know, he said at first, you know what, I can't speak for Cole, man, but I can say a lot of things, but I'm going to let the man speak for himself, and, and even Joe Soto, you know, he, he has some fight in him, and, uh, you know, a big LeVar Johnson, he, I mean, if you want to pack those seats, I'm just telling you, from promotions and, and, and marketing, if you want to pack the house, you, you, you have big LeVar Johnson there in, in some shape or form, and uh, you're going to see some extra seats uh, get, get, get uh, filled and, and, and fed with, with big LeVar Johnson fans, especially coming from Madera, California. Yeah, don't believe me. I know every single one of those names, and I know. I mean, like I said, Fresno has been beautiful to us. They they come out, show out. Uh, it's it's our, our our first home here in Southern California. So once things normalize, light at the end of the tunnel. Believe me, we're we're ready to book those fights and make things happen. I, I know you are, and uh, you know one, one guy I don't want to leave out. He's now with another company, and uh, you know that's that's Big Al Gonzalez. I mean, you know I, I told him just just recently. I said, man, you got more heart than Valentine's Day. No, oh, believe me, I have re I reached out to him. I think before the fight or after the fight. Yeah. Uh, that kid, uh, you know, I have a lot of, you know, I, how should I say that? I I see some of the fighters that I have geared towards, you know, towards stardom in him um, just because of the heart that he has yeah. and and you know what we, 
I, I came from the same type of environment he did. Yeah. So I know there's a way out. So that's why he, he kind of captures my heart. Yeah. Um, I, I want him to know that, that there's a way out of, of, of the current situation you're in. Yes. Keep doing what you're doing. And with that heart, there, there is no end goal. I mean, you could, you could take it all the way. Uh, you know, when, when you got heart, it's a scary situation. When you got heart and you got skill, it's even worse. Yes. You just need to keep working and working and working and, and make things happen because that guy, that guy will never quit. No. Never. And we've seen it in I don't know how many fights already. You saw it just uh, you saw it uh, a week and a half ago. I mean, he was literally on uh, ESPN Sports Center, um, the biggest uh, sports platform in the world, and they were showing when he was at his other event with, with another company that he was in an arm bar and just did not tap. I mean, the, yeah. the, his opponent literally used all his energy. His opponent couldn't answer for the next round. Yeah. No, I saw it. I yeah. literally asked him. I, we went back and forth. I go, how's that elbow? He goes, it's fine. I think it popped out, but, you know, I don't think out. He said, I'm yeah. fine. I'm yeah. like, oh, my God. But, <laughs> but, you know, that guy's been through a lot of adversity, and, and you know, what? he just keeps up doing what he's doing. You know, there's light at the end of the tunnel for that guy. I, I agree. And, and let's get back to the main thing. These fighters, seventy-five uh, percent uh, of them uh, that we've named, have come out with that uh, Combate Americas uh, um, shirt and, and, and fought for you guys. So you, we, I already know when you guys put on a show, it, it, it's no sleeper, man. I mean, things happen, and any fight on there, whether it's the co-main, the main event, to the opening uh, bouts, any one of them can steal the show and absolutely live up to all the hype oh, and expectation. God. I'm telling you, Rich, when, when I'm putting names together and I'm looking at your records and I'm just looking at the video, I want to see heart. I want to see you go toe-to-toe. Win or lose, I could give it, you know, one. Yeah. If you go toe-to-toe, you're going to make it on the show. I don't care. You just <laughs> that's, what the Latin, that's what the Latin community wants to see. I mean, we grew up, I mean, I, I think you're probably the same. Yeah. I mean, we all want to see. Uh, can you hear me, Rich? Yeah. Phone call coming in. No, no, yeah, I, I, I can hear you, brother. No, no. Okay. No, I mean, I think, I don't know if we come from the main, same entrance, but I mean, you, you come out as a warrior, you're going to gain fans. When it lose, people are going to want to watch. That's exactly what I'm shooting for. And, and like I said, Fresno has that. There's a few other cities, but Fresno and then California, that's where our shit is at. Hey. I, I won't disagree with you at all. I, I know the kind of guys that we've had on the show, and I know the guys that we had outside the area too, but there's nothing like some homegrown in here in the 559 area, and, and, and they've earned that. I, I know a lot of people, they like to give a, a shout-out to where, where they're from because they're proud of it, and, and, and I agree with that. I'm, you know, no, no problem with it, but when I know for a fact that we got nothing but some monsters out here that live and breathe, MMA, boxing, hardcore, uh, putting on a, a performance, entertaining the crowd, and doing what they love. I mean, you can't but forget about this area here in Fresno, California. No, and believe me, it's not forgotten. From the first time we went there, it was an eye opener. I'm yeah. like, believe me, I come from from Los Angeles, where there's a gym every two blocks. <laughs> yeah. There's fighters at the yin yang. I could book fights all day long. Every fighter is hungry. I totally understand that. But when I went to Fresno, put on the first event, I'm like, wow, these guys come get it. They come after it. They put on the show. And that's exactly what I want. Exactly what we're looking for. So Fresno never disappoints. Well, you know what? The Fresno fans, man, uh, I mean, they're, they're eager. And, you know, they're waiting for this this whole uh, coronavirus just to completely go away so you can have a live crowd because you can watch it on TV and be privileged about it and, and just be grateful and thankful. But there's nothing like, I, you, you already know this, there's nothing like living it, breathing it, seeing it, and, you know, even walking by and getting some, some sweat on you or some dry blood, man. There's nothing like a live event. And, and you guys put on a great event. I actually, the first event I went to, uh, you guys, uh, you had the tournament, and it was just yeah, put on, on. It was showcased, and uh, my gosh, I kept talking about it. So you saw Pablo Sabori versus Avila. Absolutely, absolutely. That was a ridiculous fight. Jaw broken, blood everywhere. Beautiful fight. I, I, well, I mean, just the fact that these guys w would get in the cage, go back in the dressing rooms, and come back out. I mean, you guys took it old school. Yeah. In in that in that size of that trophy, my man. I mean, you needed. A forklift to bring that thing in. <laughs> no, definitely. 
No, and like I said, going forward, uh, obviously it looks like the, the virus is going to be around for a while. Um, we're going to go towards studio shows coming in 2021. Um, I'm still going to book Fred's on talent. Um, unfortunately, you know, the, the crowd's not going to be able to come out, but you yeah. can still see him on the tube. So um, Fred's on talent is always on my mind, brother. No, no, I, I hear you, man. You know what? I, I want to talk to you. Uh, first of all, I want to talk to you. What was your whole whole take with, uh, you know, one of our best fighters in the world? J just calling it quits on, on on his terms. And you can't have but respect the, the reason why. And, and I'm talking about uh, uh, Khabib after he just took care of business, which was uh, one-sided. No, I mean, it, it, it's a well-deserved. I mean, the, the gentleman could do what he wants. He, he's literally dominated pretty much everybody who's fought. Um, I would love to see him fight again. Obviously, I'm a, I'm a fanboy. I yeah. want to see him fight Tony Ferguson. Tony Ferguson is a good friend of mine. I actually catered his uh, his uh, wife's uh, birthday party a few years ago. Oh, nice. I'm really, yeah, I'm really good friends with him. Um, I, I mean, how many times has that fight been put together? I think three times. And yeah. Fallen through. But I think it, it's a cultural thing to where, you know, he has so much respect for his mom. Not saying other cultures don't, but yeah. I think it's a little different in the Russian culture to where his mom said she doesn't want him to fight, uh, you know, without the father. This is the last fight, and it is what it is. And, and I stand true to to him saying that that's it. I, I see other fighters coming in and out of retirement. I don't see him doing that. But it, it's well-deserved. Yeah. Well-deserved. I mean, he don't be walking to that fight on a mission. I mean, like it does every fight, but this was something else. His father wasn't there. The pressure was ridiculous. Absolutely. I mean, I mean Justin Gaethje, I mean, he got tired of going backwards. And he, he put on, a, I mean, he knuckled him up. I mean, he put on some, he put some hands on him. Yeah. But he walked, he walked right through it. There was no stopping He him. walked him down, man. And, yeah. And, and, and I'm telling you, Gaethje looked tired just going backwards. And, and look at how Gaethje looked against Ferguson. He looked unstoppable. Exactly. And, and, and what, what Khabib did on that fight was spectacular, bro. Spectacular. Just, just that mental pressure, too. Just Dude, made it look so easy. No, you have no time to breathe. There no. No time to breathe. You're always on defense. He's coming forward, coming forward. And when you, when you knuckle up on him and you put hands on him and he walks right through it, what does that do to your psyche? Exactly. What does that do? I mean, exactly. Like, what am I going to do? It's like, I'm done. And it's, it just says a matter of time. It, it's like a living nightmare, man. You're hitting the kukui, but yeah. he keeps coming at you. Yeah, exactly. And, and like I said, Kadir uh, was on a, on, a, on a mission. He wanted to call it quits, and, and much respect to him. I know his coach, uh, Javi. Uh, I, I went back and forth on text with him, and, and you know, congrats to the whole team. He, he deserves to do whatever the hell he wants yeah, he, to do. He does. And retire retirement's there and, and hey it is what it is I mean we just should be happy that we saw him fight those those, those few times that he did in the UFC exactly and, and you know uh, you know, even with, with Ferguson even though he lost uh, leading up to that Styles make fights, man. I mean, talking about somebody who could have neutralized or, or said, hey, that's just my that's just my game. Bring it. Yeah. That would have been, I mean, just imagining it. That's still a dream fight. And, and even with GSP, which I think he might have taken some uh, some too much time off, or even a Nate Diaz, um, you know, I mean, but uh, Tony Ferguson, I mean, he loves that stuff. And uh, talk about somebody with heart. But I, I got to respect what, what Khabib uh, has did for the sport and, and his decision. Yeah, no, I mean, if I could retire at 32 years old, it would be a beautiful thing. <laughs> I, I, I remember, um, what, you know, that fight, and you know, the microphones were up close to him, and some of the first things that he said was, get my gloves off. So I was thinking, okay, yeah. no, he's not. I mean, I thought about it for a split second, but, you know, I never would think, okay, th this is it. But he said, he said, get my gloves off. And they normally don't say all that stuff. That's not the first thing. You know, they want some water or get my shirt off, put my sponsor's shirt on, the hat on, or, or what have you. But, uh... That was one of the first things that came out of his mouth. And, uh, uh, no, it was a shock. It was a shock to everybody. Yeah. And, and to be honest with you, when I seen Dana White in interviews after that, it was definitely a shock to him, just in his eyes. He was like, I can't believe it's done. I can't believe that, that he's walking away from it. But like I said, it's a, it's a different culture. It, it is what it is. And he's going to stand by his decision, in my, my opinion. Yeah, no, I, I can't help that, man. But let, let, let's get back to Tony Ferguson, man. Maybe you can help me out here. I've been messaging that guy like crazy, man. We, we've sent him proposals to try to get him on, on this show right here, man, because 
his platform, his interviews, his lifestyle. He is an entertainer. He can do anything. He can just go to the, uh, the store and put gas in, in his car. He's just entertaining and he loves life, especially if music is playing. Ferguson is a different animal, bro. I mean, <laughs> I've known him for, uh, I was doing shows at Hollywood Park Casino. He would come to the shows. I actually had his, uh, his boxing coach fight for me before. So I've known him for since probably 2005, 2006. Yeah. No, 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 no. I mean, no, no, about 2009, 2010. Uh, 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 uh. So I've known him for a bit. He's a different animal, bro. That guy. Uh, he is. Uh, he. he I mean, I've been uh, I, I've been out with the guy. He's uh, been through some adversity, but the guy, as far as his demeanor in the cage, has never changed from uh, from when I knew him to where he is now. He's just always been a go-getter. Always just uh, come forward. I could care less if I win or lose, but I'm gonna put on a freaking show. You know what? I uh, hey, I was uh, uh, rewinding that video he posted when he was in the hospital. I mean, he was still getting down to some. Uh, I don't know. If he was playing some old school. Maybe it was like Cutie Pie or something, or uh, uh, Lookout yeah, Weekends I, or something. I, I, I can guarantee he's playing some old school because that's where he's from. Man. He's old school uh, Chicano. That that's how I do it. That's how he does it. You know, we're gonna put some Raja. We're gonna put some Zap. Some of that old school funk. Hey, like I said, he's a different animal. Hey, he, he had that, that, that one sheet over him, and, and he had the, you know, you got to walk when you're in the hospital, you, that thing with wheels, because I've had that. I was attached yeah, to that before. Yeah, and he, yeah, and he, 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 yeah, he was actually using that, you know, to help him get down, man. I mean, music was playing. He didn't let nothing stop him. <laughs> I think he was even going to try to spin and turn around, but you know how the back's not covered? So his people are telling him, hey, don't, don't, don't spin, homie. <laughs> no, I'm telling you, that guy will, will, will try to break that in, 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 in the hospital suit, bro. There's no shame in his game. He, he's a different animal, bro. He's a different animal. And I've been looking at his videos lately. I'm like, Marco, take off your freaking sunglasses. I yep. mean, it's the middle, it's the middle of the night. He has his lopes on. I'm like, hey. But, uh, That's he, him. He's a good dude. He's great for the sport, and he's a go-getter, brother. He's a, he's gonna he's a draw. He's gonna bring Abs to absolutely the, the pay-per-view. That's exactly what people want. Absolutely, man, and, and definitely gifted with with you. Earlier on the show, you're talking about technique. I mean, this guy. I mean, he just. I mean, he can roll and then and then bring you down with just his legs, not even using his arms. I mean, the guy is just phenomenal. Every, every angle he can bring it, he's gonna bring it. Every angle. I'd love to see him in some way, somehow, him and Diaz. Because talk about uh, uh, grappling, man. Talk about jujitsu, man, and just their athletic ability, man. And just yeah, talk he's definitely. Imagine that. Talk about oh my gosh! And, and they and they'd keep yeah. it one hundred. They wouldn't even acknowledge uh, it was a fight yeah. for for the fans. They just see this man's in front of me trying to talk shit in front of me, and it's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, that's how we do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and 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 I I know you know I'm a Connor fan too, but Connor don't want any of that. He really doesn't. He, he doesn't want to get taken to the ground and just, yeah, which which is no, a fight no, that I can see happen. I really don't know what Connor wants. That guy's up and down. I mean, I know he wants big paychecks, which he's going to get regardless. Yeah. But I really don't know what that guy wants. One day he's retired, the next day he's calling people out. But, uh, I mean, it's his prerogative. It is, it is. You know, if you, if you don't mind, man, I'm, I'm going to change it up a little bit. And talking about somebody who, who knows what they want, I mean, I know you tuned in to um, the Efimo Lopez taking on Lomachenko, man, and uh, he definitely took the boxing world by storm. He is now the 135-pound reigning, defending, undisputed, undefeated uh, WBA, WBC, IBF, WBO king of the 135 division man what did you think about him shocking the world and what do you think his next move is going to be in what division 135s or 140s that's, that's a lot of damn belts no and i'll be <laughs> honest with you like i said i i was heavily into the boxing game in the 80s and the 90s and that's what i was heavily into the boxing game in the 80s and the 90s but that is one fight that i did tune into i did watch that fight and like i said i i don't know much going on in the boxing world these days um, and it was surprising to me because I was watching the fight and I think at the 10th round they put Andre Ward's um, virtual card up and I was like how does he have Lomachenko winning that many rounds yeah. I literally thought the other time I thought he dominated the fight not that he won every every round yeah. but he thought in my eyes he dominated the fight and he won as he should have uh, like I said I don't know who's next or what's coming up but I'm, I mean that fight, he dominated that fight. 
he in my eyes. I don't know what Ward was watching, uh, but he dominated. He put on a great performance, man. He, he definitely did. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of factors, but the, the main factor was he, he was awarded the, uh, the unanimous decision victory and, uh, you know, he deserved it. You know, him and his father, uh, his, he has a great team around him. I, I wish I could speak for him, but, but I can't. I mean, I can't even speculate because only they know that that team, uh, Lopez, knows what's happening next. But you know what? Anything that, that he, he decides to do, he's definitely going to have uh, the whole boxing community, the whole boxing world. And he's going to give a flip side to the sweet science, which we call uh, boxing, man. He's definitely a big superstar now. No, and it was actually, it was a great fight. I mean, the, the, I mean I'll be honest with you, I, I will try and watch boxing now, and if it's a slow fight, I'm going to change it. That fight, and the fight before that, yeah. you can refresh my memory, great fight. They went toe-to-toe. -to -toe. That fight was a great fight. I mean, like I said, I, I, I was born in the 70s, grew up in the 80s, mm -hmm. so I'm used to Hagler, Hearn, Saran, Boom Boom Mancini, Aguayo, Paz. I mean, I ran Barkley, Whitaker, uh, Azuma Nelson. Keep them coming. And those are fights. I mean, they went toe to toe. Oh, the, oh they even they in, did. Even in, even in the nineties, Diego Corrales, Castillo. That's what I grew up with. So yep. that's not really what's going on now, at least in my eyes. Yeah. Or if it's not that type of fight, I'm not really going to watch it, or I'm not going to stay tuned in for for very long. Well, I mean, if you can stay 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 tuned in for for this Friday on on the zone. Uh, Sports man, uh, in collaboration with Golden Boy, uh, you got uh, Jaime uh, Magonia. I mean, defending. Well, he's moved up now to 160, but he he was the former WBO junior middleweight champion, and he's now moving up to the 160 pound division, man. So that that fight is this Friday on uh, the Zone, and, and you can watch it, man. And uh, you know, tune in, man. I mean, you got some guys that are out there, and they're making a name for themselves. No, definitely. Like I said, if it's a fight uh, worth watching, believe me, I'm gonna watch it. Uh, I'm just saying that where I came from. Yeah, I, no, I hear you, brother. Toe to toe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when I was there, uh, like I said, I, I, I went to, when I had a little money in my pocket, I started going to the fight. I was there when Mayweather fought Castillo for the first time. And I literally fought Castillo. Oh, oh, so you were there for the first one, the controversial. I was there. I was there for the, I So who won that fight, man? I mean, you were there live. Who, 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 eyes, who won that in fight? Eyes, in my eyes, Castillo won that fight. Castillo won that fight. Mayweather was the end the We were in Vegas. Uh, I don't know how things work in Vegas, but <laughs> to me, I mean, obviously, yeah. whether it made his point in the second fight. Oh, yeah, yeah, in the um, rematch. But, but like I said, I was deep into the boxing back in those days. I went to every single Barrera Morales fight, 2000, 2002, 2004. Yeah. I was at every single one of those fights. I was there when Barrera fought uh, the Prince Hatim. Oh, I love and, that fight. And, That's actually one of my favorites. Prince Hatim came down, Prince Hatim came down in the spicy carpet. Somebody threw a cup of pee on him. I mean, it was a beautiful fight. It was, you know, <laughs> I thought it was beer, but yeah, I guess it, it was something else. Because whatever it was, pissed him off. Actually, literally. <laughs> I wasn't. I wasn't too far away from that. It, it was a beer cup. Oh, okay, okay. I hear you. No, yeah, no. I, especially, I believe in the 12th final round when he got his head and put it up against the the, the ring uh, the ring guard there. And, and just uh, he yeah. was he wasn't taking any of his tactics, man. He beat him at his own game, yeah. and embarrassed him, uh, utilized uh, his power, and, and even Emmanuel Stewart, who was in Prince Nassim Hamed's corner, after yeah. the sixth round, Nassim Hamed di didn't want to listen anymore. So Emmanuel was just kind of literally just going through the motions. Yeah, and I hate to sound like an old man, but th those were that's like that's my hatred. That was. Awesome. <laughs> hey, what brother, was you don't sound like an old man. I enjoy I enjoyed that those was, fights too. That was. Well. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, man. I mean, the first three rounds, Tommy Hearns, Marvin Hagler doesn't get any better than that. That first round, yeah. my, my gosh. Yeah, no, Hagler was my favorite fighter growing up as a kid. Hagler was my favorite fighter. Toe to toe, he's going to come at it. He's going to come with it. So in your opinion, in your opinion, who won that fight between him and Sugar Ray Leonard? Obviously, I'm going to say Hagler. I mean, I have arguments. Uh, I don't know if you know Marcos from uh, Fight Hub TV. He, he, he schools me all the time saying, oh, you're crazy, but in my eyes, Hagler won the fight. No. I've never been a, a, a big Sugar Ray fan. I, I, even though, I mean, I've met him, he's a, he's a legend. I just, I don't like that defensive backing up. I like coming forward, seeing Gosso's, seeing your face fight. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you. And one thing I do, I do respect about Marvin Hagler is when he retired, he stood retired. 
even though there were some fights there, he left money on the table. Another one who stood retired, and I thought he had a couple more fights left, even though you know he, he got knocked out. It was still his first loss. Was on uh, Michael Spinks. I still think that he had a Razor Ruddock fight left in him, or Evander Holyfield fight left in him. But uh, he left money on the table, and I respect when they retired. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. What I don't respect, though, is I, and I'll say this too, is uh, you know, the first fight, Aaron Pryor and Alexis Arguello. Uh, g give me the bottle. Which one? The one that I mixed. I mean, I, I don't. People can go back and forth about uh, with that, but uh, truth to the matter, there was something definitely inside of that bottle, other than just water, because you don't mix water. Yeah, no, no, I agree with you one hundred percent, brother. And, and like I said, that was a that was an eighties. Yes. Probably a, lot, probably a lot of funny stuff that we don't even know what's <laughs> going on, but but and you're watching whether it was on on TV, select TV. I don't know if we're the same main ring. Or, or a closed circuit TV. It, it was. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was something to watch. Oh, I, mean, oh. I, I think I told you in my in my bio. I I grew up with no cable, no on TV, yeah. no select TV. I was watching. I was watching these fights through my neighbor's window in a crack in the window, watching these fights. <laughs> and it just made it that much more fun. Well, I mean, yeah, I know exactly what you're you're talking about, man. I, I grew up listening to him on, on the radio, just the updates. And I would look over and over on the AM just to find the updates, man, because uh, we didn't have pay-per-view. We didn't have we didn't have cable. And we, we had a, a black and white TV, and then we had a color one, but you, you would move it, and, and sometimes there would be stripes, but you, sometimes you'd get it perfect. So <laughs> it wasn't always on the channel you wanted, but, yeah, sometimes we would take it back. But. Let, me put the shoe on, let me put the shoe on the other foot, Rich. Okay. Let me ask you a question. 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, what era do you think was the best in boxing? Oh, definitely the 80s. Definitely, without a shadow of a doubt, we're talking about Tommy the Hitman Hearns, a.k.a. the Motor City Cobra, Pepino Cuevas, uh, you know, Refredo uh, Benitez, uh, Sugar Ray Leonard. I mean, the list go, the, goes on. Donald Curry, uh, Marvin, Marvis Hager, I, Roberto Duran. What's that? How scary was Iran, how scary was Iran Barkley? Iran Barkley was scary. And, and let me tell you, oh let, let me let me tell you something, too. I met him in Las Vegas, and a fan wanted to take a picture with him, right? And this fan had the audacity to say, hey, can you take the glasses off? He goes, the glasses stay on. Because Iran was sporting glasses inside the casino. And he was not going to take them off for anybody. And, and, and the way he made his in, uh, ring entrance, that's the way he walked around. I mean, very scary. Big man, too. No, I'm telling you, I, I saw him on TV, and I would be like, man, that guy's scary as F. Scary. You, you know what? put on a show. He did. And you know what very surprised me is even when Tommy Hearns got the rematch, the very first round, Tommy went to the ropes and just laid there. It, it's crazy because Sugar Ray Leonard, the excellent boxer, could not outbox Tommy Hearns. Yet, Iran Barkley was able to outbox Tommy Hearns. I, I just, I just never understood that. And, and beat him twice, fair and square, knocked him out, and then you know uh, the d uh, decision. Yeah. So yeah, the so, blade. So you're, what you're saying is, I grew up in the correct era. So Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, but but I don't want to take away from a uh, uh, modern day, uh, you know, Tyson Fury, uh, Theofimo Lopez, Jose Ramirez. I, I don't want to take away from uh, Spence, Bud Crawford, uh, Mikey Garcia. Who Mikey Garcia? He's an old school fighter. You can put him back in the '80s, and he wouldn't skip a beat, and and, and jump back over here in a time machine and still take care of business. Those fighters. Or even, even, even the '90s, going back. Absolutely. To, uh, what I was talking about earlier with Diego Perales. Yeah. And the Castillo fights. How ridiculous were those fights? Oh, yes, uh, exactly. Trinidad, Trinidad, De La Hoya, how ridiculous were those fights? Absolutely, I agree I with mean, you. Yeah. Jesse James Leha, Robert Garcia, when, when he was putting him up there, and, uh, you know, R Ricardo Lopez at 112 pounds. You know, a lot of people forget he retired 49 and 0. No, and actually, in the 90s, I was running around with Rolando. I can't even think of his last name. Rolando, he was Co uh, Corrales? Vargas at the time. He was, uh, Rolando was managing Fernando Vargas at the time. Oh, okay, okay. So I was running around with that cat. I, I, I owned a, a sports bar back in the 90s. He would come visit the sports bar, so we would go to fights in Vegas with Fernando Vargas. I was there when he fought De La Hoya, so he won the 90s were good to me. Hey, Fernando Vargas is, is a tough dude, man. And the first time that I met him, I shook his hand and I gave him, you know, like a little partial hug because I, I was re-announcing and he said, hey, can you say a, a certain name for my son, but make sure you roll your R because it's after my grandpa. He goes, you got to do it right, though. Uh -huh. So talking about pressure, yeah, right? So I did it right. And he said, come here. He gave me a hug. And honestly, it felt like I was hugging a, a big a brick wall or something. I mean, that, that dude is yeah. solid, man. <laughs> I'm serious. Literally, I mean, 
he felt like a, a Mexican Incredible Hulk. I mean, that dude was just solid as can be. Yeah, good, good, good people right there. Yeah, no, uh, I, I knew that, that we chewed on the same fat, man. When you, when you were saying you grew up in, in a certain area and, and, and you watched boxing and you made the transition to MMA, you know, I, I love them both, and, I, and I'm glad I have the opportunity to cover them both, man. But uh, we definitely got to have you after this whole combate, I mean, I'm sorry, after this whole coronavirus leaves, I got to have you in studio, especially when you stop by uh, Fresno. No, definitely, man. Like I said, I, I have never done so many, so many interviews at Fresno behind the scenes I don't like my name getting out there but you know what I, I'm going to say it right now you, you pretty much bought my cherry I'm very comfortable <laughs> so it, it, it is what it is but if I can be in studio with you let's make it happen exactly especially with, with Coa Escovito we're going to make that happen hey I'm going to uh, name off some five dates for all the boxing fans right now so just just hang with us ladies and gentlemen yeah this Saturday on top rank boxing we got the return of Bam Rodriguez and I'm going to say this again Bam Rodriguez who's going to make another step closer to his world title shot and next month we have Joshua the Professor Franco in the big long awaited rematch with Maloney and that's going to take place November 14th uh, top rank boxing so talk about two brothers man and iron sharpens iron uh, they, they have the uh, the gift of of taking care of business inside the ring both trained by Robert Garcia and Robert Garcia's boxing Academy and also on the card in, in the main event of that card were this this Saturday with a Bam Rodriguez and a, I hope I say his name right and we're talking about Naola the monster in a way Naola the monster in a way. I'm hoping I'm saying his name right, man. Uh, you know, give me credit for even attempting it. Making his trip here in the U.S. 19 and 0, and I believe oh yeah, 16 knockouts, ladies and gentlemen. So don't blink. Uh, he's in there with the other brother Maloney, and uh, he got two bouts on the line. He's gonna make it happen um, for you, the viewers, the fans, man. Make sure you tune into Top Rank Boxing this Saturday. But that's this Saturday. Look how we're getting treated, man. Even though it's Halloween, and then we'll switch it up and we're gonna go to the big PVC event, Showtime Boxing. It doesn't get any better than that, man. And one of the co uh, fights on before we get to the main event is the long-awaited comeback return of Regis Rigaroo Pro Gray. He's been waiting to get back into the ring. I've talked to him personally. He's been on the show. He wants to let the world know, hey, one loss does not define me. I've talked to him over and over again. I said, any chances of you moving up? He said, no, Richard, I have business here at the 140-pound division. I want my belt back. Plain and simple, it doesn't matter if it's Josh Taylor. It doesn't matter if it's Jose Ramirez. And I said, are you sure? He goes, Richard, it just doesn't matter. I want my belt back. So he'll be back into the ring this Saturday. Showtime, boxing, uh, PBC, and also the main event. Unless you just, you know, woke up one day and, and, and said, hey, uh, what is boxing? You don't know what's going on? I don't know. I don't got an excuse for you. But I will tell you, Tank Davis against Leo Santa Cruz, the long-awaited matchup. A lot of speculation going into this fight. First of all, hey, is Tank going to make weight? Is he able to take uh, Leo Santa Cruz out in the early rounds, or will he drown late in that fight in the late rounds? Now, a lot of questions, too. Will Leo Santa Cruz be able to take the power and the pressure of Tank Davis? We don't know. That's why this is another great matchup. PVC is doing big things. Showtime boxing. You got my man uh, ring announcing. I know you're going to have Ray Flores is there you got uh rumbling ralph is going to be there ral marquez is going to be there the whole pvc staff is going to be there money mayweather is going to be there lynn is going to be there anybody that's running with showtime man will be there live and uh be there and anticipate the winner of that fight man and uh you know we're going to flip it back to our guest right here who had a hang with a little bit of, of going back with the boxing man and, and that's uh you know tony man i you know I, I think we can still make you into a boxing fan man i think you can juggle more than one act how, how does that sound to you man <laughs> hey I'm, I'm i'm not saying i'm not a boxing fan i just gotta get up to par i just gotta get up to par with who, who's in the mix these days Hey, man. Well, just remember the name Jose Ramirez, Theofimo Lopez, Manny Pacquiao, Mikey Garcia, and uh, you got uh, Bam Rodriguez, and you also got Joshua Franco uh, from Adair, California. You got, uh, gosh, Brian Lua, and from Fresno, I'm still waiting on you, and I have faith in you, Isidro Ochoa. And if I miss somebody, you know, somebody will probably text me and be a little upset, but it's okay, man. 
You got it, my man. No, uh, looking forward to see those names up on the uh, on the marquee. Absolutely, man. And uh, um, you know, big shout out to all the fighters, man. E either entering the ring or the cage, and uh, you know, wish you uh, all the blessings in the world to be safe, man. But I, but I can't leave this tonight without hey taking you know. Uh, tip to my hat to the Los Angeles Dodgers, man. We finally did it. And a lot of people would put us on blast and say, all we do is choke. And, and, and what I would tell them was, hey, we're going to keep going until we get it right. And last night, we got it right. So congratulations to the Dodgers, man. And, uh, you know, e e even my son, you know, I wanted to um, share that moment with them. But uh, we had our moment together, and we, and we did share it together, man. And uh, just having you as a guest, Tony, and uh, I knew I was going to bring you on. I was thinking, okay, this guy didn't do interviews. And I was thinking, he, he probably thinking he's only going to do 10 or 15 minutes. So I was thinking to myself, I'm going to let him talk and feel comfortable. Once he's comfortable, then I know he's going to be hooked. And it sounds like you're hooked, my man. You know, in your position that you're in, get used to it because you're going to be doing a lot of interviews. Hey, sounds good, brother. Like I said, uh, believe me, I, I'm not used to this. I have butterflies coming into it, but you made me very comfortable. And a uh, big shout out to my friends and family, brother. I can't. I, I look forward to seeing everybody and friends out, making things happen again, get the mix going on again. Right on, man. So how do we stay in tune? How do we follow you, man? What's your Instagram? What's your Twitter? How do we stay in touch? Uh, like, like I said, I'm old school. I mean, you can, you can see me on IG, uh, Sparshar MMA, or on Twitter, Sparshar MMA. But if you see a food picture... That's fine. If you see anything else, that's my team. <laughs> there, there you go. Hey, I want to thank everybody that, that's in tuning in to us. And don't forget to uh, continue to subscribe of uh, The Fighter's Voice, our YouTube channel, www.youtube.com slash The Fighter's Voice. That's www.youtube, The Fighter's Voice. No, wait, yeah, www.youtube slash The Fighter's Voice. Remember, every fighter has a voice, and so do you. Live here in Fresno, California, it's a wrap with our guest, Tony Padilla. I want to thank him once again. Thumbs up for Richie. Okay, fight fans, it's not goodbye, but until next week. Remember, remember, remember. It's always voiceography at its finest. So on behalf of Richard Ortiz, Cole Escovito, the special guests, and all the crew right here at the Kick-Ass Podcast, saying hasta luego, babies. And always, thanks for listening.
So the vote centers are areas or places where you can take your ballot actually in um, to talk with election officials to be able to cast your vote and be able to, to submit that. Um, your vote center locations, as well as your drop box locations, are inside of your purple um, uh, elections information. They have all of those locations in there. Uh, but again, the vote centers will be open this Saturday, uh, October 31st. So the 31st, 1st, and 2nd, they'll be open. Most of them will be open from 8 to 5. There's a couple of locations that are open from 9 to 6. Uh, in certain locations, there are language. Um, there'll be interpreters there, um, heavily in Spanish and in Hmong. There's also uh, some other languages, uh, Farsi, uh, and some other Punjabi, I'm sorry, Punjabi, um, as well as some other languages that will be available in the public school. So please do your research on that. Please make sure that you cast your vote and please make sure that you participate in that. Uh, I'm going to tell everybody, I'm encouraging everybody to vote yes on Proposition 15. That is a proposition that undoes Prop 13 from 1978 um, and forces, a, forces businesses and corporations uh, that, are, that, make, that generate over $3 million a year to pay their fair share of property taxes. Uh, currently, those businesses are paying property taxes at a 1978 assessment rate. And so we need to get them to pay their fair share. Uh, that proposition, voting yes on 15, does not affect homeowners. It does not affect agriculture. So agriculture is exempt from it. Uh, like I said, with small businesses, um, if you are under, if you generate under $3 million a year in your business, you are not going to be affected by it all. So please don't leave the hype out there. Uh, please vote yes on uh, Proposition 15. Um, it's estimated to generate 15, 11 to $15 billion um, a year in California that can be distributed to schools as well as municipalities, cities, and counties, and those type of things. That's my political front, man. Uh, what's going on with you, G? I'm oh, being beautiful. <laughs> Having conversations, you know, there's a lot of stress in the world. Um, a lot of stress. I I, uh, I didn't know that, that people were that stressed out. You know, I had a, a guy at work ask me, um, you know, how to handle stress. Because we've had some conversations in the past, and, you know. Oh, man. The city of Fresno has yes, and is still trying to put me through it. So I told him, you know, uh, understand that stress and anxiety, stress leads to anxiety. Anxiety is a manifestation of fear, and fear is not real. It's a... Uh, a mechanism to to control you and your bodily functions to tell you to run so that you can stay safe. But you know, uh, people without fear usually end up getting hurt. But if you can control it, um, there's nothing to be afraid of. You know, just like, uh, he was a, he, he's kind of worried about going down to the Santa Cruz area um, Tuesday night during the vote because of all the stuff that everybody has been saying. I guess there's memos and all kind of stuff saying that people are going to act the food, you know, on uh, uh, November 3rd, uh, Tuesday, the day of vote. And he was kind of, he was really concerned about that. And I, I, I kind of, he asked me what I was going to do. I said, nothing. Keep on pissing in my back pocket and keep on, keep, keep moving. I said, you know, don't, don't, don't worry about it. Enjoy your life. I don't think that California will be Rejections out of the California, places such as California and New York are not going to be heavily impacted um, immediately with some of this unrest that's you know, projected. Um, it's other places such as Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Florida, um, places such as that, where the, and unfortunately Philadelphia is on fire right now with um, the execution basically of that young man who was having a psychological break. Um, yes, we might have to circle back to that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think, I think that California is going to surprise some people with the unrest. Um, I was in a, <laughs> I was in a gun store last week, and uh, you know the guy we got to talking, and uh, he said that he's getting emails, three or four, five, six emails every day about you know where to meet, what to do, and take our country back, and if, and if the Democrats steal the election. And he was, he, he, once again, he asked me what I um, thought this about is it. Gun, this is the gun store owner? This is the gun store owner. Who so had, why is he? 
think about this. Why would he be sharing that information with you if his intentions was to do something nefarious? I didn't say his intentions were to do anything nefarious. I'm saying that people were sending him emails and stuff. Um, just because you receive emails don't mean that you're going to do something nefarious. I don't think that he was going to do anything. He was just saying that this, that's the, uh, the way things are looking. Um, because he's getting information, this much information on a daily basis. So don't let it, don't, you know, my thing is prepare. And if it don't happen, then, then you walk away with a chin, with a smile on your face. But if you prepare and something happens, at least you'll have an exit strategy and a strategy to defend or a strategy to, to keep yourself safe. Uh, one, of the, one of the greatest quotes I've ever heard was Killer Mike who said, you know, teach your children when they get pulled over by the cops to um, to navigate that situation and uh, survive the encounter. So that that's a, a sound strategy. But that's a different the encounter. That's a different encounter, though. Um, that's an encounter where there's force on one side uh, and no force on the other. If, if you've got force on both sides, that's a whole different encounter. I don't, I don't follow. I don't follow. So you got officers who have force, officers who have guns and lethal weapons. You have people who are being citizens are being pulled over, for the most part, who are not, who do not have lethal weapons with them, who do not have force. So that's a totally different exchange of a person who has. A lethal weapon in their pocket and have an intercom uh, uh, interaction with another person who has got a lethal weapon in their in their possession. That, that's a total. The outcome is going to be totally different. I, I, I'm, uh, yeah, but I mean, it's I don't quite understand. I was talking from the common person on election day, um, going to get something to eat with his family and, and encounter someone um, from the other side of the ledger, be a Democrat or Republican doesn't like the fact that they have a Biden sticker on their back of their car, a Trump sticker on the back of their car, and 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 have something, as you say, nefarious in mind to attack someone who's just minding their own business in society. You know, once again, that encounter, you know, you have to have a game plan to, to and an exit strategy to, to survive that encounter. Does, I mean, so you know, in your scenario, um, a person who is packing, who encounters a person who is not packing, the worst case scenario is, is that the person not packing is dead. A person packing... I, 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 don't, I don't know where you're going with this because, because the, the average citizen is not packing. Then I'm confused as to where you're going. Because I was going to be on the huh? What I'm saying is, is that the, the best outcome is officer or individual, a, a person having the same amount of force in their, in their pocket or in their possession, doesn't, that just makes the situation for me uh, worse. Um, who's okay. going to be... So, so I, I gather that when I'm talking about the average Joe says who is not having something in their pocket, it's just out, um, trying to enjoy themselves and their family on, um, no one has anything in their, in their pocket, you know, just being accosted by the opposite side person saying and st making that statement that, you know, hey, I don't like you because of X. Just my thing is just for the person to have an exit strategy to survive that encounter. No weapons, no guns, no nothing in, count in, in anybody's pocket. You know, just, just survive the encounter. I took that analogy from Killer Mike explaining to a group of African Americans that that's what they should teach their ch children when they come in contact with the police. It's not about being big and bad and telling the police what you're going to do or not going to do or being hot-tempered. Um, it, it's a matter of surviving the encounter. And that, that's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Uh, let's see. Which topic do you want to go to next? Oh, I, I have a free and clear uh, mind. The, 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 the execution in the record in Philadelphia, how, how disgusting was that? I haven't seen it. I, I purposely did not uh, look for it. Uh, I heard about it. I don't know what time it was last night, dude, but I've been up 
since 4.30 this morning, man, because I couldn't sleep. Um, my house was the house last night.
probably, um, if, if, if the line is straight, to be the chair. to um, if you're uh, if you're the female in a headlock and you're calling uh, 911 you don't want it to go to so social services and then be redirected or rerouted uh, to the police department you would rather have it go to the police department first for the term determination and then to ser social services so it's kind of the same way it's kind of the same way when 911 first was implemented and you dialed 911 from your cell phone um, and you had a city issue, and it would go to the uh, to the um, uh, CHP first, and you uh, lose critical mi uh, critical mi minutes there, um, trying to discern that if it's a nine one one emergency or not. So then, what you're saying is, is that that police officers need to be trained to be first responders, no matter what the situation is, whether it's a critical situation about life and death whether it's a psychological break whether it's a, a domestic dispute what you're saying is that the police officers should be always be those first responders to those situations because of no the that's not no 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 once again that's not what i'm saying i'm saying that the phone call should go into the police department first the night which is connected into the police department through the 911 dispatch but so then, but like you're saying right now, it's critical time about a person, a lady who's in a headlock. Well, the young man who got killed last night, there was critical time timing about who was responding to his issue. Because what I understand is, is that there was two responders. There was the police who got there first, and the medical people who was also requested showed up secondary. By the time they got there, um, they had already shot the kid. And so that's what I mean about. Um, and I understand about the training and all those other type of things. My concern is, is that as long as 911, 911 is under the police department, everything is a nail and they're coming at it as a hammer. And that's what my concern is. There's got to be a, a, a way, whether they come up with a, okay, you've got an emergency situation where it's life and death, you call 911. If the situation is psychological, then you call 811. If it's, I don't know, something else you call 711, we've got to come up with another another situation rather than funneling everything through the hammer, through the police department, which is the hammer. We've got to be able to funnel, like the young man in Philadelphia, we've got to be able to funnel those situations through another entity. Because if we continue to go through the police department, unfortunately, I think we're going to continue to get these results, the outcomes that we've been at. Well, yeah. Um we will continue to get the results that we're having until the proper training has been dispersed and implemented uh, through the people who are doing the job. If the police officers that responded to that critical incident and situation um, um, had the training as, uh, as officers such as in, in, in London and different places where they waited till eight or nine people show up with shields and, and, and rushed the guy with shields because he has a knife and you can't stab through a shield, and, and, and body weight and pressure holds him down, that, that's a training technique that they could use to disarm this person. You know, um, that, that, yes, it's, a, it's a all about training. No matter, no matter what um, the situation is, it's about training. Again, it's, not, it's, not, it's not always about um, just because you're a police officer uh, you're a hammer, um, um, and, but I understand. I understand the current mindset 
of police officers and how they conduct business currently where they put themselves in a position where they are hammers. Well, they have, they have to be retrained so that they can understand that they're not hammers. They might be the tool bag. And in this situation, you know, we're going to, we're going to park a, a block and a half down away from him. And we're going to, we're going to wait till we have um, four people because he hasn't harmed anybody yet. He's, he has a knife. We're going to wait till we have a group of four people. Someone's going to have lethal. Someone's going to have a less lethal. Someone's going to have a shield. Someone's going to be uh, able to talk to them or, or the arrest person. You attack the situation in different ways. And all of that comes through training. It's not just a, it's just, it's not just, you know, I was listening to another radio station here in Fresno early this morning and they were frustrated because they're saying that, you know, how come he couldn't just listen to the police, you know, the police. And then they talked about how, how people should be trained. Well, if you've never taken on the position of talking to someone who is not in their right mind, be it drugs or, um, you know, an impaired state or imba chemical imbalance in the body and the mind, you don't know what you're walking into. You have no idea what that person might do. And I've, and I've encountered them all from PC, people on PCP to people shroomed out to people who are out on, on their on a limb, alcohol or emotional states and breakups. Um, people. So let me ask you this question. Where, where did you get trained to be able to respond to those situations in the manner in which you do? Uh, life experiences and through the police department and training. Amen. I'm glad you said that first part first. A person brings into what they're doing first their life experiences. In particular, when they're in a stressful situation, tr police training doesn't come up first. It goes back to your life experiences, uh, your life, the training that you got in life. And when you got a person who is uncomfortable with a person who is having a psychological break, when you have a person, a law officer, who is uncomfortable with a person of a different ethnicity, a person who is uncomfortable with a different gender, those type of things, those life experiences come into play. So how how do you meet? I mean, in what manner do you mitigate those life experiences that you have so that the police training that you receive becomes number one? That's the concern that I've got. You you train and train and train. But the police, department, police departments aren't doing that. Our, our law enforcement, even in school, our, our school administrators are not doing that we got a lot of school administrators who have those same issues and they don't they don't have a gun that they can shoot kids with but why do you think so many kids of color in particular african-american boys and hispanic boys are, are suspended and expelled from school it's because those principals those leaders bring their life experiences in there and when they get in a, in a stressful situation it's the first thing that happens is your life experiences and then the training that we get from education comes in secondary so I, I hear what you're saying. My concern is how do wh where are we going to get that from? How do we how do we um, how do we mitigate a person's life experiences so that they use the professional training, law enforcement or education to be able to help situation? That's that's the part. You you, you, cor you correct their behavior when their life experiences. Um, are wrong or have taught them the wrong thing. Okay, but you, you have to fall back on your training. When I, I, I didn't know everything that I knew when I started uh, in law in a law enforcement career. I didn't, ha it was a foreign language to me. You know, I, I met people that were um, uh, sons of, of law enforcement officers um, and, and people of that ilk. Um, and they had a, a jump start, but it didn't it didn't stop me from being the as a, as a matter of fact, I think one of the reasons that I met the faith that I met with the police department was because I did have such life experiences. I know I'm a special person. So training, training, training it's, if it's training to to write better, if it's training to deal with situations better if it's tr you have to train whatever is in a person out of a person 
the reason that we have all of these situations and issues, even in school situations, even at the police department, is from systemic racism. Correct. That's what it is. That, that's Correct. what we have. We have people that believe that other people are less than human beings. And it, so was, it, taught, those, it was taught. It was taught to them from, like you said, their life experiences. So if the person cannot get past those life experiences and understandings, then they should be weeded out of the job classification or the modifications. I agree, but how? What's the process for weeding them out? We've got we've got a lot of psychological tests. You have you of, have people that go through the academy. You have people that that do all the, all types of different ways to weed people out. You weed you weed people out that don't have those issues in the process. You weed you you the, the police department administrations look for people that will do exactly what is happening in our society. We don't, nothing is done by mistake. The majority of people that, that, that run the police departments do exactly what they're supposed to do. They don't have a problem with the police department being ran the way it's being ran. The people who are being unjustly victimized, un, uh, uh, cruel, uncruel or cruelly attacked, those are the people that have problems. So it's it's a it's a it's a, a mindset that has to be taught. Yes, uh, police officers, as well as I'm sure school administrators, have um, uh, ethnic diversity training. They, they they have all of this training. They need more of it. They need to understand. And that's the only way you're going to get it is through training. I'm just curious as to how when this training is supposed to come in. I mean, I, I agree with you that I believe that the training is is um, is an asset or, or, or an aspect um, to be able to overcome this. But where do you get it from? These same people who who you're talking about are, are perpetuating the white supremacy in these in our two entities, education and, and, uh, and law enforcement are the same people who are doing the training. Right. And so. Well, well no, no, I'm not going to say the same people that are doing the training. I'm not going to agree with that. The, they're the administration that oversees um, the whole of the industry, uh, be it education or be it law enforcement, that are that way. It's not the training. Well, in, a, in education, the trainers, most of the trainers are the problem. The people who are teaching um, and training administrators to become school administrators are the issue. Um, and I don't, and, and it's not a matter that they're being an issue on purpose or that they are racist or any of those type of things, but they bought into uh, the white supremacy and racism, institutional racism that, that permeates the educational field. Uh, well, that's, so, that, that, that's what I've been saying since we started this went way back when we were a radio show, that this is the, that is the religion of our society, racism, white supremacy. So it's everybody's job to try and mitigate that, to, to, to remove that um, out of the equation. It's hard. It's not easy. It's hard. Yeah. But that but that's what the, the problem is, is that the people in power don't want to give up the power. They don't want to be they treated as equals. They want to be treated as, you know, as if there are something more than or special, more special than the next person. So what's the answer? If that's the problem, what's the answer? Well, if you could execute all the people that thought like that, you know, you said that half the uh, society is under 40 and the other half is, uh, or there's more people under 40 now, you, you, you have to wait until, they, until the natural changes takes place, until they die off or continue to educate them. When they, when they say something or do something to you, you have to speak up. You have to tell them and stop them in their tracks with those types of, of um, pointed out to them. The problem with that is that when you have a difference of opinion with your boss or your administrator and you point it out to them, they don't, they don't fare well with that. And they, take it, they take exception to that. And they want to lash out and, and they want to lash out and like the, the normal thing that people do is eliminate what they see as a problem. And whatever is different is a problem. It's, it's that simple. 
you know, I just I, I'm I'm into the to this this part of my life where I'm into to coming up with solutions. I know what the problems are. Um, I know what the issues are. I know what the concerns then, are. Then for you, for you, what is the solution then? Um, I don't know. I'm still working on it. I don't have necessarily um, a, a way of doing that. But I'm not going to sit by and let attrition um, play out because attrition, if you wait for attrition, that means that those legacies and people, have, or well, the, the systems will never be corrected. The system will only change because the old people have died off. And that doesn't... Well, happen. well, I, 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 that was only a part of what I said was attrition was a part of it. The other part is to stop and speak up when you see something, when someone unjustly treats someone else. You have to be oh, the I, defender or the super person for that. You know, okay, well, and, 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 wait, and wait. as we're saying, to, to lighten it up a little bit, I'd like to say peace. To all my clansmen with your interracial grandchildren okay. things are changing you even say that every week things are changing things are. are changing they yes are. they are yes they are and sometimes you just have to wait you you, you 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 have to wait but when things are brought to you you have to it's not a situation where like what we were talking earlier in the evening if some if you're if you're out with your family on election night and their candidate has lost and they bring some issue to you you need to be able to survive that issue. If it's, hey, you know, um, please don't do that. You know, we're just out as a, as a, as a nice family um, and we're just trying to make it from point A to point B. Could you please go and deal with somebody else to protect your family? Then that's what you have to do. You have to be able to speak up for injustice when it happens to you. And, 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 and it might take on a lot of many different forms, but you have to be able to survive the encounter. Or, or if you turn and turtle and run, then it's going to continue to happen. It's going to happen to you, and then 15 minutes later, it's going to happen to somebody else that looks like you, and 15 minutes later, it's going to happen to somebody else that looks like you and the person that you that just got assaulted or whatever, and it's going to continue until that action is stopped. Okay. That's, a, that, that's society and how we, where so we are. When you say that society. action is stopped, what do you mean by that action is stopped? I mean, getting away walking away and leaving the situation stops the incident. If we're talking about self-preservation, you exiting yourself from a situation is a tool of self-preservation. That's a way of, of mitigating a situation. Does it mean that the next person who comes across that same uh, encounter won't encounter a negative thing, but you yourself have, as you said, you've been prepared and you've been able to mitigate um, the, the, the negativity in that exchange. So I, I just... No, there's not there's not one answer to any of these things we're talking about. Um, no, this is this this is life. This is life. Things are going to continue to go on until until uh, they're stopped. Be it through death, be it through um, arrest, uh, be it through a, a, a lot of different things. So, so that person has a, a, a change of mind. You know, it'll it'll stop eventually. Some everything comes. Everything has a beginning and everything has an end. It's what's in the middle that happens and counts and people keep tally up. So, um, you, you got me now to thinking about um, that new show that you got me hooked on, Lovecraft Country. And the, some of the storylines that goes on inside of that. Have you been keeping up with that? Yeah, it's over. You mean the season's over? Yeah, the final episode is over. The I watched every episode. Jigabobo? Yes. Okay, so the the episode there towards the, 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 the scene there towards the end where the white lady gets herself beat up on the pier and then thrown into the river? Right. What, what's your take on that? Okay, because it was because it was written by an African American and written and directed with the main influence of an african-american woman i think that what she was trying to show people is that um without sounding too harsh white folks don't have empathy white folks um don't have an understanding of what it is to be treated in a certain way the conversation that was had between her and 
um, I can't th- think of the the lady thicker, the thicker sister. Yeah, you're correct. The dark the dark sister was about what it felt like, what what it what it actually felt like to be in that position and to be in that predicament. So she went because she knew that she couldn't die. Um, I'm trying to think of these names. Um, the 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 white lady um, had a premonition to understand what it felt like because she didn't have empathy for African Americans or for people that were put in that situation. So she went and paid two white guys to beat her uh, and kill her, just like they killed Emmett Till and throw her body in the river just like they did Emmett Till so that she could have that compassion so that she could have that understanding basically so that she could be trained to understand correct so what where in law enforcement do you see a process such as that occurring because I I equate what she did 100% 100% of what you're saying, but I'm just envisioning it in our two um, areas of employment. Yours on the law enforcement side, mine in the educational field. Where do you see an, a law enforcement agent or an educator putting them, not saying, understanding and realizing, I don't understand what's happening with my kids. I don't understand what's going on in this community in which I, went, with, with, in which I work. Let me go and take my licks and lumps so that on the other end of it, I'm going to be better for it. Well, first of all, you have to have an open mind. You have to understand that you're not in a community to strictly enforce the law, that you are a human being, that you have compassion, and that you are dealing with people that are human beings, flesh and blood, and have compassion. So you might arrive on a scene where a mother is over a child who has just been uh, murdered and bleeding out. Well, you have several things that you need to understand. You need to understand that you have to preserve the scene. You have to understand that she might be a witness to what happened. You have to go in with the training and the understanding and the mindset that you have to gather all of these things. And unfortunately in Fresno, which is turning out to be back in the 90s, late 90s, early 2000s, when I was trained, a killing field and a killing zone again, where you have these calls on a nightly basis, where you're going to domestic violence calls, or where you're going to homicides or shootings or stabbings. You know, you're, you're going to these, and every time you go to these calls, you have to have your mind prepared to learn, not just to service that call. You have to you have to go into that situation understanding that every call is a little bit different. And every situation and everybody needs to be handled as a as a first time or first term person. That all comes with training. You you're, you're not going to be the same officer that you were day one as you are your last day on the job. So, but my question is more specific to that. Where does an officer get that training? Like I've said several times tonight. You get the training on the job, in the heat of the uh, of the battle of the job, dealing with the individual people, and you get it in 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 formal training, sitting in a classroom, being educated by people that have written books on this, that have taught this, the state certification um, that you need for officer advanced officer training every year or every two years. That's where that comes from. Now, if it's, up, if it's up to the individual who doesn't want to listen or doesn't want to understand, well, that's a whole situation. And then you have to take that person and, under, and, and as a, an administrative level and say, this person just isn't getting it. And this person is not a good fit for my community and my society. I got another suggestion. I think that you cannot, on-the-job training happens, but that's not the best teacher. Because if you're going in as a law enforcement, how, 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 go ahead. If you're going in as an educator to an education situation, there's an uh, there's power that you bring to that situation. You are not on an even level with those that you're working with. I believe that if you're going to get the empathy that you're talking about, you've got to go 
into those communities. You've got to go to those people when you're not under the cover of law enforcement, when you're not under the cover of being an educator. Something as simple as going and take, you go, when you go buy your groceries, going to go shop in the store that is in the community in which you're working. Uh, if there's a social event, going not as a law official or an educator, but going to this event as a person of the community. And we've gotten away from that. Um, you know, I can give, there's some examples that I can give you of people who are still doing that, but I would be willing to bet that in south of Shaw, of all the principals that are south of Shaw, I'll give you a hundred dollars if you can give me 10 of them, and there's probably more than 100 school sites, 10 of them that live in the communities in which they work. So here's a testament, here, here's a testament to what I'm talking about. Our buddy, Tim Lyles, who was the principal at, at Sunnyside High School, less than 10 years. I don't know how many years it was exactly, but I know it was more than five and less than 10, okay? is getting, because of the impact he had on that community over there, he is being honored with a segment of the school, in front of the school, in his honor. Guess where Tim Lyles lived the whole time he was a principal at Sunnyside High School? I know exactly where he lived. A half mile from the school. Okay. So not only was he, well, not only was he the educational head of the Sunnyside Pyramid, he was a community person there. He shopped there. The, he socialized out on, uh, when him and his wife went out to eat and go to dinner, they socialized in the, in the restaurants that are out there on Clovis and Kings Canyon. He was part, he, he was a principal, but he was more importantly, a part of that community. I, 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 be, I, I would struggle to find you another example in education, educational leadership that's like that. And I think those, when you talk about getting empathy, that's how you get empathy. You don't get empathy. But, that, but that's not the only way that you get empathy. Agree. I agree. I agree with you. But I think it is an easy way. And I think that that goes back to a, a person, the, 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 the young lady, the white lady who's in, that, in, in, the, in the television series we're talking about, who has been painted as this witch and evil person, all of a sudden at the end, because she's been shown and told and has been proven to her, hit her in the heart, that she has no empathy for black people. She pays these white boys to kick her ass on that pier, tie her, tie barbed wire around her neck like they did Emmett Till and throw her, tie it to a weight and throw it over into the river so that she can feel and understand, at least attempt to, what was going on with Emmett Till. You know, how many educators or law enforcement people do you see doing that? Well, once again, it, 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 it depends on how you're looking at the elephant. If you grab the trunk, the leg, the tail, uh, the tusk to understand what, it, as a blind person, what it looks like. For the longest time, there were only two, three um, officers that lived on the west side of Fresno. Okay, all African American. That was it. But you can't tell me that I didn't have empathy for the West Side. You can't tell me that some of the other officers that were not even African American didn't have empathy for the West Side. Because you can learn. We're, we're human beings. We have the capability of learning through the proper training. Now, if you don't want to learn, and if you, like some, go over there because they think it's easier, or they don't want to have their kids exposed to that environment because it's been painted as a negative for so long there's 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 a myriad of reasons why officers don't live in the neighborhoods in which they patrol but that doesn't mean that you can't have empathy for those folks i, I understand but, what you're but, saying but that does but that is a huge barrier to gaining empathy that you need to be successful in those settings so, so let me ask you this. So would you, oh, oh no, it's, it's not a huge barrier. It's, it's, a, it's a consequence or a factor in. So 
would you only have people that live on the west side work on the west side or live on the east side work in the east side no no because you need to have some um so, so, so how do you how do you incentivize uh the um structure of education and the structure of law enforcement to live in um less desirable places okay. um just so, so that they can have a, a, a empathetic eye leadership. and this is the conversation that i had with superintendent nelson who i've got the utmost respect for you you have not had any black male principals in your school district since 2012. Congratulations and thank you for now hiring two black male principals in your school district for 2021. I applaud you for that. It needs to happen. However, why did you send them to West Fresno? I, I don't I don't follow what you that's what you just asked and said. Those, both of those gentlemen that are hired, the new two, both of the black male principals that are hired in the district have no personal connection, lived, born, grew up, worshiped, have no connections to West Fresno. So what, so what are you saying? He should have hired some people from West Fresno or he no, should have sent black. some other people, he should have sent some other people that are qualified to West Fresno from a different community. I don't, I'm not following. You need to not only send black male principals to West Fresno, they need to be sent across the rest of your district, as well as if you've got quality principals in your district and other areas, and you've got a school that's struggling, such as what was going on with Kirk, such as what was going on with a couple of the other schools that are there at West Fresno, these high quality principals that you've got across your district, if they can't go and work in West Fresno, then they shouldn't be working for your entity. They're not high quality. I, 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 I agree. I agree with that. So that that was my point to him. And he he, he 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 admitted that he had not thought about it. He understood what I was saying about the optics of it. And he committed that the next opportunity he has to hire African American principals, he will not be looking to specifically place them in West Fresno. His three oh, actually he just hired I, three I, black I, 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 I'm I'm gonna push back on that because I'm glad that the black folks you can shake your head all you want, but so, so, I am I am glad that he hired African Americans to run a leadership site in a in a place anywhere in the district. So now maybe these 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 uh, African American men can get a foothold and understand from the point of the perspective where they are, and then venture out and bring somebody else with them. That's a whole different line of you, our mindset. That, that means that you're buying into and siding with the institutional racism that permeates Fresno Unified. Who is? You are, what you just said. You're crazy. Okay, okay, okay. You're wrong again. Uh, I'm because just... you're you're because you're because your focus is so narrow and and it, and it sounds like How and I don't want to I don't want to sit here and attack you, but it it, it, it sounds like we hired um, three black principals this year and all three of them are in West Fresno. And you have a that problem is with that. part of the institutional racism that is permeated Fresno Unified. The black so, 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 so black my question then is, can the, the only question work then is West would you would you rather them not have a job? Would you rather them not be principals in in, in West Fresno? Would you they, rather them no, not they, be they principals? They should be principals. They should be hired. They were a, they've hired 15, I want to say they hired 15 principals. Why why do those black principals have to be put in West Fresno? Why can't they be? Isn't isn't your isn't your PhD on the leadership role of African American males as it relates to other uh, as as African American students? No, it's about African American male leadership as school principals. So so a principal at a predominantly Caucasian school across town can be a leadership for uh, the kids that are in West Fresno. Yes, and if he can't, if the person cannot do that then they can't be part of what I believe, they can't be a strong part of the entity. If you can only work in one neighborhood or with one type of child in Fresno Unified, you're ineffective. You you are part of the institution. I don't know where I don't know where you are. <laughs> I don't know where you are. So 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 an officer in Fresno PD who can only work in West Fresno 
or can only work it in any of the five precincts, cannot work in any of the other precincts, is he an asset or a detriment to the department? As long as he can get the job done, then he's an asset. I disagree. Okay, of course you do. You've got you've got to be able to have interchangeable parts. And if what you do is good in place A, then those same strategies and techniques need to be implemented and be able to be replicated in other areas. And I that is the, one of the issues that Fresno Unified has had is that they pigeonholed these different ethnicity groups, ethnic groups, as far as the, the leadership, into certain areas of the city. And until we can we can get rid of that, we basically are perpetuating the white, the racism and white supremacy that's in the district. You know, when when back in the day when we were when we were kids, Stan McDonald was the principal at Hoover. Uh, Hoover and Bullard and Hoover, very successful principal there. Uh, John Shropshire was out at Hoover, uh, was out at Awani. African Americans was all over the city. African American male principals was all over the city. Why now? And the last African American principal that was in this district in 2012 was also in West Fresno. We have got to be able, if we're going to be able as educators to have a strong, vibrant, base of leadership you've got to be have interchangeable parts you know back to my boy tim lyles tim lyles would have been successful anywhere in this city because of his background his empathy that he's gained from his personal relationships his family and the way that he grew up tim would have been a successful principal no matter what principal what what high school you put him at anywhere in this district you can't say that for the other principals that you have here in fresno unified and i think that is what the, the the district, the leadership of the district has a responsibility of doing is making sure that you've got quality people that, that are interchangeable to be able to make your your your, your leadership cadre vibrant and, and healthy. And that's not what, what, what we've got going on here, unfortunately, here in the Fresno area. So I, I, I just I, I, I agree with you about the empathy part of us. Um, I agree with you about the training. Um, but I also know that you have to be empathy comes not under the under the cloak of your position. Um, empathy is gained more about what you do on a personal side. And so I, I, I just believe that. So anyway, we're up against it. It's, it's a, a minute to nine. So anything else you want to any other topics you want to talk about real quickly? Uh, no, I see that. Um... No, just to kind of follow up that we talked about last week without I would ice cube. I um, went back and rewatched the interview with, with well, not rewatched for the first time with Roland Martin. I watched the interview with uh, Chris Cuomo, um, and and I I'm still sticking with my guns. Um, he 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 came up with a plan. He tried to do something. He he, he reached out there, um, and folks didn't uh, unfortunately didn't like it um i think that uh, the reason they didn't like it is because um who didn't like because, it? Be, because it was a lot of people a whole lot of african americans are lashing out behind the the statements of like you were saying he needs to stay in his lane he's an entertainer and not a um and uh and not a politician but i i i still Stick behind him, hundred and ten percent. I mean, my whole thing is, I hope he don't give up on it. I hope that that he doesn't, because um, I applaud what he's trying to do. I just don't think he totally understands um, how to get it done. And so, if he's true to the game, if this is really something of, of, of substance to him, I hope that he doesn't give it up. I hope that he continues to pursue it. He continues to tweak it and change it and add in and delete and talk to more people about it um, because I, I believe that what he's doing, um, what he's attempting to do is done in the right vein. I'm not questioning that. I'm just I'm questioning if he really understands the lane that he's attempting to get in. And I'm not sure that he's there yet. So because it's going to be interesting. I, 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 um, this time next week we will have – the election will be over. We'll have some results in. I don't think it'll be done, but we'll have some results.
and kind of see what the lay of the land is going to be for the next four years um, and go forward from there. So anyway, again, make everybody, please make sure you get out and vote. Um, please don't put your, your ballot in the, in the U.S. mail. No disrespect to the U.S. mail, but they have even said that they cannot guarantee with six days remaining, actually it'd be five days when we get up, five days remaining before the election, uh, that they can guarantee that your, that your ballot will be in your elections office before uh, next Tuesday. So please use your drop box. Please vote in person. Um, please do your research to find out what, what is available to you as far as being able to cast your ballot. So, G-Money. Hey, like I always say, stay beautiful. Love, peace, and hair grease. All right, God willing, we will see everybody back here again next uh, next Wednesday at 8 o'clock uh, for your next dose of Intel with the Boys. Peace.